Therefore, it is time for question period. The member from Prince Edward Island. Thank you, Speaker. My question this morning is for the Acting Premier. Speaker, we know that the opposition parties think that the $4.6 million compensation package for the Hydro One CEO is too high. We know that the Ontario public thinks that the $4.6 million in salary for the CEO at Hydro One is too high. We now know that the Ontario Energy Board, the OEB, thinks that the $4.6 million salary for the CEO of Hydro One is too high. But what we don't know, Speaker, is do the Liberals think that the $4.6 million salary for the CEO of Hydro One is too high? Minister of Economic Development and Growth. Minister of Economic Development and Growth. Speaker, I'm not sure why the opposition have such a tough time understanding the role of the Ontario Energy Board. I'm not so, so sure why they seem to want to have it both ways. When, when the, the Ontario Energy Board makes a decision that I think you know, we all believe is in the public interest and do their job, uh, they want to criticize them then. Uh, and then they, they, they talk about the Ontario Energy Board not having any role whatsoever in trying to lead consumers into thinking. I'm, uh, I'm not going to be accepting those kinds of interjections, so uh, be warned. Well, actually, I shouldn't use that word until I want to do that. Be aware that I am not going to accept those in interjections. You know, I think they're trying to lead consumers into thinking somehow or another that the government sets energy rates and it's not the Ontario Energy Board. The Ontario Energy Board has an important role to play, Mr. Speaker. They're doing that role. We're proud of the role that they're playing. They're standing up for Answer. consumers, as this government did when we cut the energy rates by 25 per cent for our consumers, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Speaker, perhaps the minister didn't understand the question, but the Ontario Energy Board has ruled that $4.6 million is too high of a salary for the CEO at Hydro One. That salary was handed to the CEO by this Premier and this Liberal government two years ago. The Premier tried to defend this outrageous salary by saying this is what they pay in corporate America, and that's actually less than American energy CEOs, so $4.6 million is acceptable, is what the Premier said. But I don't think the Premier can still spin it that way, given the decision by the OEB in the last week that we're paying way too much for all of the executives at Hydro One. It doesn't require spin. Mr. Uh, Minister, Speaker, Mr. Speaker, do the Liberals think that a four? It's really simple. Do the Liberals think that a 4.6 million dollar salary for the CEO of Hydro One is too high? Thank you, <laughs> Minister. It's funny, Mr. Speaker, a party that used to understand the importance of putting private sector acumen into decision making in some of our agencies. It now seems to want to go the exact opposite direction. Hydro One is now a publicly traded company. Our role, Mr. Speaker, is to ensure that they have the ability to provide the best possible level of service to the people of this province, taking advantage of that private sector acumen and improving the level of service and improving the return to the people of this province of that now publicly traded corporation. We believe that's going to be in the public interest. We believe we're going to see and we're seeing improvements in our energy system as a result of that. And we believe the Ontario Energy Board is doing their role and performing it very well in ensuring that that public interest Answer. continues to be served. I'm not sure where the, the member finds that there is some kind Thank of you. a problem with, the, with what's going on. Thank you. Final supplementary. If I'm reading between the lines here, it seems like the minister believes that a $4.6 million salary for the CEO of Hydro One is acceptable, and this Liberal government believes that a $4.6 million salary for the CEO is, 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 is acceptable. And I can tell you that people across the province disagree with this Liberal government, vociferously disagree. Bill Kelly from CHML in Hamilton put it pretty well, I thought. He said that the Ontario Energy Board's recent decision slapped down Hydro One because they wanted ratepayers to, quote, cover what they called administrative costs, which is a sly way of saying that they wanted more money to give increases to their already overpaid executives. In fact, in the OEB ruling, they decided that the budget needed to be cut by $30, $30 million. So, Mr. Speaker, why did it take Question. the Ontario Energy Board and not the Liberal government to slap down these high-priced executives at Hydro One? 
Mr. Speaker, this is far from the first time that the Ontario Energy Board has asked one of the uh, the uh, energy agencies to reduce their uh, their their rate asks, uh, their rate increase asks. In fact, it's very very normal. It's happened almost every single year in every single application, and I can I can share with the member a list of dozens of times where this has happened. The Ontario Energy Board's doing their job. They're looking out for consumers across this province. This government's doing our job by lowering energy rates across this province for those very consumers. Mr. Speaker, I asked the member opposite to do his job and tell it like it is, Mr. Speaker, that the Energy Board is simply doing what is in their job procedurally to ensure that consumers' interests are looked after. And at the same time, we have an energy system that is being improved Answer. on a daily basis by this new publicly traded company. I think that's good news, Mr. Thank Speaker, you. for the entire province. New question, the member from Nipissing. Thank you, and good morning, uh, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Finance. Last month, there were two legislative reports on the state of Ontario's finances. They were described as uh, blistering and scathing, and those descriptions, Speaker, are well deserved. Both of the legislature. Stop the clock, please. The member from uh, Beaches East York, come to order. And as I indicated to both sides, I'm not going to tolerate the inter interjections. And you'll see how quickly I'll deal with them if I have to. Continue, please. Both of the legislative uh, legislature's independent officers openly challenged the ministry's credibility. The Financial Accountability Office said that the minister is using, quote, unlikely assumptions, quote, to make his debt claims. In fact, they said that if any of these wild assumptions fall short, the government's targets would not be achieved. They particularly took issue with the government's overly optimistic growth projections. So, Speaker, if the FAO doesn't believe the minister's numbers, why should the people of Ontario? They don't. Thank you. Minister Finance. Mr. Speaker, economists independent of government across Canada have cited this. Ontario is leading the way in economic growth in our country. The Conference Board of Canada has cited that we've outperformed and have the most transparent uh, uh, levels of reporting than any other government in Canada. Mr. Speaker, this member opposite continuously degrades and and talks down the outstanding achievements of Ontarians and businesses in our province that are creating wealth, creating greater prosperity, hiring more jobs. We have the lowest unemployment of any part of this country, and we are overachieving every single year that we put forward our budgets to the benefit of Ontarios. We've reduced the deficit to under $900 million, Mr. Speaker, just last year. And we're going forward. We're balancing the budget this year, next year, and the year after that. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Ba back to the minister. Uh, the FAO's comments were strong enough, but Speaker, the Auditor General painted an even more damning picture of the minister's financial reporting. For the second year in a row, the auditor wouldn't sign off on the province's books without a big asterisk. But the auditor went further, stating flat out that the statements are, quote, significantly misstated, quote. She says our deficit last year was $1.4 billion higher than claimed, and our debt is a whopping $12.4 billion higher. She warned us and the markets and investors that we need to be able to rely on government's figures being accurate, but this year they cannot do so. That's her quote. You cannot rely on their numbers, is her quote. Speaker, again we ask, and I know they're belittling Question. the auditor, I can hear their comments again, but we ask, Jay, if the AG Jay and the FAO don't believe the minister's numbers, Thank why you. should we? Minister. Mr. Speaker, investors around the world believe our numbers. The people of Ontario throughout Canada who buy our bonds believe our numbers. We have the highest liquidity of trade in bonds of any government across this continent, in fact. And, Mr. Speaker, our debt to GDP has been reduced, and it continues to reduce below 37 percent, again, overachieving our targets. Our accumulated deficits, which is a representation of the historical activity of Ontario's uh, uh, budgets, 
Today, Mr. Speaker, it's at around 27 percent, the same as it was 25 years ago, Mr. Speaker. Wow. Our, our interest on debt as a, as a percentage of revenue today is 8 percent. When he was in power, when the PCs, progressive Conservatives were in power, Mr. Speaker, it was 50 percent of our revenues. Ooh. We are overachieving, and we continually do so. We are using the same standards as we've always done, including what the Auditor General has done even as, as recently as three Thank years you. ago. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Final supplementary. Thank you. Back to the minister. So if the minister is comfortable using, quote, significant misstatements and, quote, unlikely assumptions, then it should be no surprise to hear what else he continues yeah. to claim. They continue to say, quote, we're leading the G7 in economic growth. But Ontario is not number one, Speaker. There are 27 U.S. states ahead of us. And the minister continues to claim that manufacturing exports are up. But StatsCan just last week reported that Ontario manufacturing sales suffered their largest decline in eight years. Here are some of the recent headings. Trade deteriorates. Exports languish. Ontario residents hit hard by manufacturing downturn. International merchandise exports fell. Manufacturing sales slip. Speaker, given all these examples, plus the financial Question. accountability officer and the auditor general's criticism, how can anyone trust anything Dr. this government says? Can you see it, please? Can you see it, please? Thank you, Minister. Mr. Speaker, facts do matter, and that side of the house. Well, we're there. From now on, we're going into the warnings of those interjections, and the member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke, come to order. You brought us to this point. Warnings are on. Finish. Mr. Speaker, facts matter. This member opposite is citing uh, sources. The member from Leeds Grenville is warned. Carry on. Citing references from years past, recognizing that as of today, Ontario is ahead of the curve. Our unemployment rate is the lowest it's been in 16 years at 5.7 percent. And, Mr. Speaker, that's not to say that we're not continuously looking at stimulating economic growth around all of Ontario, recognizing some regional disparities Answer. exist. That member opposite and that party voted against those measures that improve prosperity, stimulate growth, and continuously balance the book. Thank you. New question. The member from Oshawa. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. In my community of Oshawa, I have constituents come into my office all the time to tell me about their long wait times in the ER. Lake Ridge Health Oshawa is no different than hospitals in Tilsonburg or Etobicoke or Brampton or Toronto or Peterborough, which just announced that it will open 24 beds without help from this Liberal government just to try and keep up with the number of people who need care. In February of 2017, the occupancy rate of Lake Ridge Health Oshawa's acute care beds reached 92 per cent. Does the Premier have a plan to fix this unhealthy mess that she's helped create in Oshawa? Thank you. Deputy Premier. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Health and Long-Term Care. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And of, of course, uh, unlike the party opposite that simply opposes uh, all of the plans that we have for addressing capacity and wait time challenges across this province, uh, uh, different than the party who opposed our $500 million investment in hospitals uh, earlier this spring, we do have a plan. And with Lake Ridge specifically, and they are facing challenges because the member knows it's a rapidly growing area, we've given them a planning grant so that they can actually plan not for today but also 20, 30 years into the future for that entire region of Durham. And, and in, in fact, we're doing the same in Scarborough, Mr. Speaker. But for, for Lake Ridge itself specifically, they're working together with Ontario Shores to open up a brand new behavioral support unit, which is specific that we're providing 20 beds for ALC patients that have mental health needs, Mr. Speaker, so that they can decant those out of hospital to a more appropriate setting. That's Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Again to the Acting Premier. Lake Ridge Health in Whitby is also over capacity. In February, it reached 102 per cent. I would like to remind the Premier again that a maximum of 85 per cent over capacity is considered safe. The Premier has said over and over again that she makes decisions based on evidence. 
While the evidence that Ontario's hospitals are facing an overcrowding and hallway medicine crisis is out there, the evidence is piling up, literally piling up in the hallways. Why is the Premier refusing to act on the facts? Thank you, Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, I'm gratified that the member opposite mentioned Ajax Pickering Hospital, because, which is part of the Lakeridge Health Corporation, Mr. Speaker. And Lakeridge Health received uh, this year uh, alone, uh, Mr. S uh, Speaker, a, a $6.6 million increase in their operating wow. budget to allow them to wow. make modifications and provide, continue to provide that high-quality care. But also, when it comes to Ajax Pickering, it, Staying in line with the discussion on mental health beds specifically, we're opening 20 new acute care mental health beds at the Ajax Pickering site as well, in addition to what we're doing at Ontario Shores. So we're, we're listening to the local community, we're listening to the hospital leadership, and we're making those multi-million dollar investments on the operating side and on the capital side, Mr. Speaker, to make sure that they are able Answer. to competently address with the highest quality service those sp uh, uh, particular needs, Mr. Thank Speaker. Thank you. Final supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Again to the Acting Premier. In Oshawa, as elsewhere, it's not just acute care beds that are over capacity. Mental health beds are also locked in a constant state of gridlock. Both Lake Ridge Health in Oshawa and the Lake Ridge facility in Whitby registered capacity numbers in their mental health beds of 115 per cent wow. last winter. The Premier cannot defend this, but can the Premier tell the people of my community when is help from this Liberal government coming? Thank you, Minister. Well, I would hope that the member opposite would understand and believe that 40 brand new beds for mental health. 20 of them for ALC patients that have specific mental health challenges, 20 acute, which is through Ontario Shores in concert with the Lake Ridge site in Oshawa, as well as 20 acute new beds at the Ajax site. But, Mr. Speaker, the NDP in a single year in 1994 announced a $53 million cut to 10 of Ontario's psychiatric hospitals. That represented up to a 17 per cent cut in the operating budget of some hospitals. Hospitals in Hamilton, in Brockville, in Kingston, in Thunder Bay, in London, North Bay, Penetang, Toronto, St. Thomas, and Whitby. A $4.7 million cut in Hamilton alone. A $5 million cut in Whitby alone, Mr. Speaker. $6.3 million in Kingston. Answer. And at the end, the NDP was forced to backtrack. So instead of $53 million, they only cut $20 million in a single year, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question, the member from London, Fanshawe. My question is to the Acting Premier. Yesterday, the Minister of Health said the vast majority of long-term care homes in Ontario are meeting the province's minimum standards of care set out in the various acts that, they, that apply to them. But what the Minister and the Premier fail to realize is it seems that, it's, that this is not good enough. Families with loved ones in care have been coming forward, speaking up for months to tell this Liberal government about the heartbreaking conditions in some of these home care homes. Does the Premier not care what families are telling her, or is she just out of touch with what's really going on in this province? Deputy, Deputy Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Well, Mr. Speaker, the NDP continues to disparage not only our hard-working frontline workers in long-term cares across the province, but also does not understand, in fact, that we are listening to Ontarians. We are listening to residents of long-term care homes who call long-term care homes their home, Mr. Speaker, and we have an obligation and a responsibility that I take very seriously to ensure that we're providing the highest quality of care. But I don't, again, I need to ask the question whether that party is going to vote for or against the new legislation that has just been proposed last week, Mr. Speaker, that actually will increase our ability to further inspect homes, will increase the penalties and fines available to government to impose upon those non-compliers, and give other powers to the government so we can ensure that not only is there yes, compliance with the Act, but this, these homes, Mr. Speaker, are of the highest quality possible. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, this is what's happening in long-term care. Seniors are being left in beds for 18 hours, getting a bath just once a week, constant short staffing and lack of consistency in care. Vulnerable seniors are not even getting the basic help they need to make it to the bathroom on time. 
These are just a few of the thousands of stories described to me in the past few months by families with loved ones in care. How can the Premier continue to claim that everything is fine in these homes when she hears from families themselves that there is a crisis happening right under her nose? Thank you. Minister. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and that is precisely why this week I issued three cease of admissions to uh, long-term care homes in this province because they weren't complying with the Act, because there were director's orders against those homes for uh, issues such as a fall taking place and that fall not being reported to the proper clinical authorities, the physician that would then do the proper assessment, that these are important, critically important uh, activities that need to be taken, that need to be done in adherence with the Act. Uh, but I'm also, Mr. Speaker, it's impo also important to recognize that we're seeing that impact from our inspections, annual inspections of 100 per cent of our long-term care homes, and we're seeing that since 2014, the average number of compliance orders issued during an annual inspection have actually Answer. gone down by more than 50 per cent. Sure. We are seeing the improvement. The inspections are working, but we need to identify and act on those that are not in compliance. Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, the three cease admission orders in London, Mississauga and Fergus are indicators of systemic problems in long-term care. You, Premier and, and Minister, over and over again, we have told the Premier and her Minister of Health the heartbreaking stories of neglect and even abuse in long-term care homes. Over and over again, we have called for the wet law for inquiry to be expanded so that we can get an honest picture of what's happening in, long, in the long-term care system, identify the systemic issues and fix them. But over and over again, the Premier and her minister have ducked our questions and refused to expand the inquiry that would help thousands of people. They are content to ignore the problems in our long-term care system. Can the Premier tell us when will there be enough evidence for her to take this issue Question. seriously? Well, Mr. Speaker, we are taking it seriously, and we've been taking it seriously for a lot longer since the member opposite and her party have been raising this in a partisan fashion and fear-mongering among this across this province so that people in their long-term care homes if they're afraid they don't need to be afraid of the quality of care that they're receiving with a few exceptions mr. speaker that we're addressing effectively they need to be afraid of what the NDP party is doing in fear-mongering and suggesting to Ontarians that lo their loved ones are not safe in long-term care homes I think it's reprehensible I think it's completely in the member from London Fanshawe is warned. Finish, please. It's inappropriate to be elevating it to that level of conjecture and, and fear mongering across this province, Mr. Speaker. Yes, if sir. they believed in supporting the long term care sector, why did they vote against our $80 million investment in this year's? Thank you. Your question? The member from Oxford. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the acting Premier. Two weeks ago, I stood up in this legislature and asked the Premier to change her policies that are driving jobs out of Ontario, including the 1,300 layoffs we've, that have been announced in Oxford over the last 10 months. Business after business warned this government that the high cost of operating in Ontario would force them to close their doors or move. Yesterday, 200 more layoffs were added to that total as Firestone announced that they are closing their doors after 81 years and shifting the remaining production to North Carolina. Will the government now finally admit that their policies are driving jobs out of Ontario and take action today? Minister of Economic Development and Growth. Well, let me respond to that question in two parts, Mr. Speaker. I, I want to start off by, by saying that. Uh, that we share the members' concerns for that community. They've been hit by a couple of significant layoffs in the last, uh, in the last uh, month or so, and uh, we're very aware of those challenges, and in fact, we'll continue to work with local authorities there. Uh, really, our focus will be on helping those workers find other opportunities, uh, and uh, we'll continue to ensure that our training colleges and universities are, are our, now MAISD, uh, will uh, will be engaged in that as well. And we'll work. Member from Lanark for Athletics and Eddington is warned. And I'll keep doing it. 
to me at this time, Mr. Speaker. We're talking about something very important to one of his colleagues. So we'll, we'll, I look forward to working with my colleague, uh, as, as yes, well, uh, my colleague minister, to help in any way we can. In the supplementary, I'll address the issues thank about you. Ontario's competitiveness. Supplementary. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. 1,500 layoffs in Oxford in less than a year and 2,800 CAMI employees on strike trying to keep their jobs in Ontario. The government can try to spin this however they want, but that's the impact of your policies. The people of Oxford are doing everything we can to support our local businesses, but this government just adds more and more burdens until the companies are forced to close their doors. How many more people have to lose their jobs before you're going to take real action and keep our businesses and our jobs in Ontario? Minister. Mr. Speaker, now it's time for me to bring the member into the real world, because that is not the real world in Ontario or anything even close to it. This province is growing, Mr. Speaker, faster than the G7s on average. We have an unemployment rate in this province that's at a 16-year low. We have created a net 760,000 net new jobs since the global recession. So for the member to talk down the work that's being done in this business community in this province to create jobs is absolutely inappropriate and absolutely wrong, Mr. Speaker. I understand there are challenges in that particular community. There's been a couple of very significant layoffs, and we will work with the member to help those workers, but the best thing we can do is to stay on track, and that's keep building this strong economy in Ontario, keep our yes, lead sir. in leading the G7, and keep that unemployment rate at record lows, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. We're determined to do that. And we Thank you. Your question, the member from Algoma, Manitoulin. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Children and Youth Services. In a letter you received from Chief Elaine Johnson from Serpent River First Nation, if a family lives in Sault Ste. Marie, Blind River, or Elliott Lake, they have direct access to Algoma Family Services Children's Mental Health Services. However, if a family lives on a First Nations community, they receive no children's mental health services from Algoma Family Services. Minister, why is this? Thank you, Minister of Children and Youth Services. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to uh, thank the member for the question. Um, I've been in this uh, position now for just over a year and uh, have had the opportunity to visit uh, many of our Indigenous communities across the province of Ontario. Uh, in fact, Mr. Speaker, last uh, two weeks ago, I was in Treaty th at Treaty 3 uh, and uh, met with the uh, chiefs in Kenora, and um, I signed an historical document uh, out there um, moving towards an agreement between our Indigenous partners and the Government of Ontario to put the resources and the control back in the hands of the community so young people from the Indigenous communities can get the services they need and they deserve uh, where they live. Uh, this is the first time in the history uh, of this province, in fact this country, that we've made a type of agreement that will put the responsibility and the ownership of the responsibility uh, to look after children back into the hands of the communities where it should be, Answer. and I'm very proud of this government's direction uh, in regards to that policy. Again, to the Minister of Children, Youth and Services, um, Algoma Family Services has indicated that they don't have the expertise or resources to provide any services to First Nations in my area or to Indigenous children who are in the care of Nagdawindamin Family and Community Services. This is why Nagdawindamin has submitted a proposal to your ministry to fund the delivery of culturally appropriate children's mental health services to my area First Nations communities. Your ministry simply answered that there is no money for this. Okay. Minister, every child matters. Why is there no money for direct treatment of children's mental health on First Nations in my area? You want to uh, Mr. Speaker, we brought forward Bill 89 uh, this year. Uh, again, it was a historical document. It's the first document in the history of this country uh, that uh, acknowledges that cultural, a cultural approach to, uh, uh, to working with uh, communities is necessary. It actually acknowledges that systemic racism uh, does exist, and uh, Indigenous communities have, uh, have been victims of uh, colonialism here in the province of Ontario and across this country. But Mr. Speaker, you know, when we move forward with that, uh, that bill, 
Um, you know, the NDP did support it. The Conservatives uh, did not support that bill, Bill 89. We still don't know why uh, today that they didn't support that bill that raised the age of protection and actually moves forward to build a framework to put those resources back in the hands of the community. Mr. Speaker, you'll see um, as we go forward uh, here in Ontario, yes, those resources will be put back in the hands of the community, and it's the first government in this country to do just that. Thank you. Any question? A member from Kingston and the Islands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the minister responsible for the status of women. This past week, I received a very concerning call from my daughter. She was walking down the street in Ottawa when she came across a protest, Mr. Speaker. She was walking by the Morgan Toller Clinic. We know in recent months, protest activity outside of several abortion clinics across Ontario have escalated to the point of harassment and intimidation. My daughter, who was simply walking down the street, felt it, and she called me about it. Let alone the women and health care providers that work in these clinics. This is not right, and we know that it is happening all across this province. Mr. Speaker, as a woman, a mother, and a member of this government, we have a responsibility to act. Question. Yesterday, the government introduced legislation that would have passed due just that. So, Mr. Speaker, can the minister please tell us about our government's plan Thank you. to keep these women safe? Minister, response the status of women. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the member from Kingston and the Islands for raising a very important question. Speaker, as a woman and mother myself with a young daughter, I have an obligation to not only my daughter, but to all women in this province and their daughters who make a difficult choice. It is my belief and our government's belief that every woman in Ontario has the right to make decisions about her own health care and that they should be able to do so freely without fear of bullying, intimidation or harassment. In fact, that is why our government introduced safe access zone legislation yesterday. That sends a very clear message that we will not tolerate any form of harassment against women exercising their fundamental right to choose. These proposed access zones would help ensure that women across Ontario have safe access to health care services and that their privacy and dignity are protected. Sir, thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I know that the women across this province are relieved and the staff at these facilities uh, about hearing this government's action to work towards this. However, Mr. Speaker, I would like some further information about the legislation. Mr. Speaker, the difficult decision that these women make is not one that is ever made easily. It's a very difficult decision they live with for the rest of their lives. The reasons for making such a decision is deeply personal and entirely up to them and no one else. We have a responsibility to ensure the privacy and emotional well-being of these women who make a choice about their own physical and emotional health. This responsibility, of course, also extends to health care providers. So, Mr. Speaker, through you to the minister, how can we ensure that Question. there is safety in every clinic, in every home, and on the street? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member raises a very good point, and I can tell you that yesterday the health care professionals and advocates in the room were very supportive of the proposed changes we are making to protect their patients and themselves. In fact, they applauded. They were telling us how much this legislation was needed, needed to stop women from being harassed, intimidated and bullied. This legislation, Speaker, would, if passed, provide for the creation of safe access zones of 50 metres that can be increased up to 150 metres around abortion clinics. Speaker, we can't just stop there. We also have a duty to protect the safety and security of the staff, the staff that offer women's reproductive services, which is why this legislation would also implement safe access zones of 150 metres around the homes of the staff. Answer. Speaker, we're moving forward with this legislation because we take it seriously, because we have a responsibility to the women in this province. Question the member from Sonia Lampton. Uh, Mr. Speaker, thank you. My question is to the Deputy Premier. 
Deputy Premier, recently the WSIB made significant changes to its hearing aid program without properly consulting audiologists and WSIB recipients. Before the summer, the Minister of Labour committed to looking at ways to fix the mess the WSIB has created. However, months later, the official opposition is still hearing from patients right across this province who cannot access the hearing aid that works best for them. We've heard stories of individuals limiting their time with loved ones because the hearing aid they are now forced to use is affecting their quality of life and hearing. Deputy Premier, Ontario hearing aid patients are asking you to put them first and reverse the WSIB changes that are not benefiting anyone. Anyway. Mr. Speaker, I ask the Deputy Premier today, will you act? Thank you. Thank you. Of labor. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to uh, the member for that important question. I think a number of us in the chamber have been asked about exactly the same thing, Speaker. And what we need to ensure is that the WSIB is operating in the best interest of workers at all times, Speaker. Exactly. It's an organization that was put in place to ensure that if somebody is hurt on the job, our preference, Speaker, is that the injury does not take place in the first place. We work hard on prevention. Should that injury take place, and Speaker, from time to time, those injuries can include hearing loss, we need to ensure that the services that are provided to the worker are services that meet the needs of the worker, Speaker, whether it's a return to work, whether it's a recovery from illness, Speaker. So the information that the, uh, the member has brought forward was a change in policy at the WSIB. It was an attempt to ensure that the services that are brought forward in terms of hearing aid, Speaker, are the ones that are best to yes, meet sir. the needs of the injured worker, Speaker. We have talked to the WSIB about this. We remain in conversation with them. We hope we can. Thank you. We hope we can reach a resolution. I'll address the Thank rest you. in the supplementary. supplementary. Thank you, uh, Speaker. Uh, to the Minister of Labour again, just one single audiologist from my riding of Sarnia Lambton alone has sent over 30 appeals to the WSIB in the last few months. It takes an average of three to six months to receive an answer. In my riding, I have met with more than a dozen affected uh, constituents and received over 200 handwritten petitions on this issue. I can only imagine how many other patients and constituents are being impacted right across this province. Mr. Speaker, to the minister, let's do what's right and what's fair and make sure that injured workers in Ontario have access to the hearing aid that they need without further delay. Will the minister deal with this issue today? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Minister. Speaker, um, I, I appreciate the uh, question from the member. And he and I have had a number of exchanges about health and safety in his own writing. I've always found the meeting. I've always found the member to be very, very sincere. Bob's he brings guy. issues to me first. He doesn't try to. Uh, he doesn't try to hijack the House Speaker when he brings these things forward. Not so, Speaker, all. I'm committed to continue to work on a variety of issues with the WSIB, Speaker, because I know they're brought forward sincerely. In this case, what I think you have, Speaker, is an organization, the WSIB, that thinks it's doing the right thing, that has looked that has looked at what exists today in terms of hearing aids that are available to, uh, to members of the public, to uh, citizens of Ontario that need to avail themselves of the services of the WSIB, and have tried to provide that service in an effective and efficient manner as they so. possibly could. However, Speaker, you have a number of citizens that think that this Answer. is not working for them. I believe that working with a member, we can sort this working out and Bob. everybody can get what they need at the end of the day. Thank Speaker. you. Question, the member from Wellington. Uh, uh, Wellington. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Deputy Premier. This morning, the Liberal government made it clear they don't intend to support the NDP's push for paid leave for victims of intimate partner violence, despite clear evidence that too many women are afraid to escape because they simply cannot afford to. We heard from Unifor Sue McKinnon at the Bill 148 hearings this summer, who described one woman's nightmare. She packed her life in a basket and fled with her three children. She was in constant fear of making sure her kids were fed, safe, and had a roof over their heads. And she still had to make mortgage payments on a home that her partner destroyed. Why is this government ignoring women who say paid leave will help them escape with their lives? Minister of Labour. Well, Speaker, uh, I appreciate the question, but we are doing anything but ignoring women in the province of Ontario. You look at the impacts of Bill 148, Speaker. A lot of the advantages that will be gained by the passage of that bill, should the House presume to do that, Speaker, 
will be aimed directly at women who haven't been treated in the past in the workplace exactly. the way they should. Speaker, that's the whole point of this. I was in Hamilton this morning, speaking at the YWCA. Speaker, as a result of us taking Bill 148 out after first reading, Speaker, we were able to hear from people around the province exactly. of Ontario. And one thing they brought forward was something that the member is bringing forward again, Speaker, and that is domestic violence. Speaker, exactly. people need to know that when they need to take time off in the eventuality of that, Speaker, that their job is not in jeopardy. That they're not in risk of being fired. And, Speaker, that's exactly what we do with leaves in the province of Ontario. Yes, I believe if we work together on Bill 148, Speaker, we can, we can bring together. forward a bill that will exactly meet the needs of these women, Speaker. Supplementary. Uh, back to the Acting Premier. New Democrats have repeatedly called for paid leave for victims who need it. The member from London West introduced two pieces of legislation. Your government is stalling it. New Democrats introduced amendments to Bill 148 during the uh, clause by clause. The Liberal government voted against those amendments. The NDP leader last week, the member from Hamilton Centre, introduced uh, a bill that would have 10 days paid leave for victims of sexual and domestic violence. So, survive can actually afford to take a leave, so they can afford to have time off to file police reports, so they can testify and have time off to testify in court proceedings against their abusers. But the Liberal government refuses to support this. Why is that? Well, Speaker, once again, I appreciate the question, but the information being brought forward to the House Speaker simply is not accurate in this regard. Oh. I was out in Hamilton this morning, Speaker, talking publicly about the reason we took Bill 148 out in the first place, Speaker, the way that we have listened to the people of the province of Ontario, the way we are bringing forward up to 17 weeks, Speaker, of job-protected leave. What we do in case of uh, 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 compassionate leave or these types of leave, Speaker, is the province under the Employment Standards Act, under the Labor Relations Act, under the Occupational Health and Safety Act, Speaker, provides the job protection. Says to the individual, your job is not in jeopardy during this period of time. We then turn to our federal counterparts in Ottawa, which I have done, Speaker, and we ask them to provide the income during that period yes, under the employment insurance. Good. We're doing the right thing here, Speaker. We're doing right by women. With the support of the I House, Speaker, we'll get to where we need to get to. No question. The member from Barrie. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question today is for the Minister of Advanced Education and Skills Development. Nice. Ontario has one of the most highly skilled workforces in the world, and this is thanks, in large part, to the incredible transformation of our post-secondary system sure. that we've undertaken in the last 14 years. As I'm sure all of us will agree, increasing access to post-secondary education by removing unnecessary barriers is one of the best ways that we as a government can help improve the life outcomes of Ontarians. As such, Mr. Speaker, can the minister please inform this House how we re we've removed barriers and increased access to post-secondary education in our province since 2003? Thank you, Minister of Advanced Education and Skills Development. Well, thank you, Speaker, and it has been a remarkable 14 years yeah. for post-secondary education in Ontario. Speaker, members of the opposition have said that. They don't believe that cost and income are real barriers to post-secondary education. Post education. They, that couldn't be further from the truth. We know that participation rates for kids from higher-income families are far, far greater than for lower-income families, and that's why we've moved forward with an extraordinary transformation of student assistance of OSAP. Speaker. This year, over 200,000 students in Ontario are getting free tuition. Speaker for hundreds of thousands of more students. Speaker. That's almost one third of our students are getting free tuition and another third are getting help as well, Speaker. The number of students is already is, is uh, yes, the number of students attending has also gone up dramatically, Speaker, by over thirty-eight percent. We've made investments and they're paying results. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thanks to the Minister for her answer. When our government was first elected, our post-secondary sector was in desperate need of significant investments to make sure that its institution could continue to provide the world-class education our students expect and deserve. 
But we know that world-class education and instruction requires world-class facilities and faculty. Accordingly, Mr. Speaker, can the minister please share with this House and all Ontarians some examples of significant investments our government has made to improve Ontario's colleges and universities in the last 14 years? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Speaker, as I said, uh, enrollment has gone up by 38 per cent, but grants to colleges and universities have almost doubled. They've gone wow. up by 85 per cent. And that allows our colleges and universities to hire top-tier instructors, instructors and, and deliver state-of-the-art programming Lawrence. speakers. We've also invested heavily in the physical structure, their facilities as well. You know, Speaker, when the Conservatives were in power in 2000, their last year of power, they spent about $100 million on capital for colleges and universities. Speaker, we have on average invested $300 million a year on colleges and universities. And we've been able to do that, Speaker, so that we've been able to build important projects such as the Software and Informatics Research Centre at UOIT in Durham, Speaker, um, the Beta Library Research and Innovation Cluster at Trent. These are just two examples of the extraordinary investments Thank you. we have made. Your question, the member from Stormont, Dundas, South Glengarry. Thank you, Speaker. To the Deputy Premier. The government is no stranger to the Nation Rise Wind Project in the township of North Stormont. If it had been paying any attention, it would know that the municipality doesn't want it and the local residents don't want it. The minister has admitted that the province doesn't need the power that Nation Rise or any other wind or solar contracts are still being offered, signed and imposed on unwilling communities will generate. Nation Rise scores zero on all the ISO's rated criteria. Yet, it was still offered a contract. It is unwanted, unneeded, and unjustifiable. What is this government waiting for? Why will it not cancel it? Minister of Economic Development and Growth. Minister of Economic Development and Growth. Well, Mr. Speaker, the, the, the Minister of Energy and the previous Minister of Energy have put in place a, a, a process now that very much takes into consideration the local concerns about these projects. But time and time again, Mr. Speaker, the party opposite, their true top colours come out. Any time there's any resistance at all to any renewable project, they're up on their feet talking about how they don't support renewable clean energy. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, we do have to start thinking of the big picture here. We need to start thinking of our kids and the health of our, our population. And that's why, Mr. Speaker, while local concerns are very, very important and we've taken measures to ensure that voice is heard, we're very proud to be the first jurisdiction anywhere in the world to eliminate coal and move to cleaner sources of power. That's going to help our kids live longer. That's going to save lives in this province. Yes, and Mr. Speaker, it's helping to build a very strong clean tech sector here in the province of Ontario. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, back to the Deputy Premier. It's clear that we just don't need the power. All the independent experts who have taken a look at this government's energy record have gasped in dismay at the total mess that you've made it. Only this government could force clean, green Bruce, Bruce Power to vent steam to reduce generation, spill renewable water resources over our dams, pay wind and solar company, companies more than the power is worth, cause an 8 terawatt surplus in generation, sell the surplus for loss, and then proclaim that everything is just fine. We already have a surplus of power today because Nation Rise, before Nation Rise is even built. This province doesn't owe the owners of Nation Rise a contract, but it does owe the citizens of North Dormont a duty to listen and to represent them. North Dormont is an unwilling host. Which part of unwilling does this government not understand? Yeah, sir. Question, thank you. Minister. The Minister of Environment, Mr. Speaker. For the Environment and Climate Change. Well, thank you, Speaker, and, uh, and thank you for, uh, for that uh, important question and, and the ability to once again stand up and uh, defend green energy in this province, Speaker, yeah, yeah. because I'm not sure if the party opposite actually believes in green energy, Mr. Speaker. You know, this government, this government takes concerns regarding the environment and, and human health very seriously, uh, and let me say that, that our ministry adheres to a very strict renewable energy approvals process. There's not, Speaker, there's not a single renewable energy project 
that uh, that the PCs have ever spoken in support of here in this house. So they have no plan to help Ontario families and businesses make sustainable choices and lower. Member from Prince Edward Hastings is warned. Your time has expired. New question. The member from Windsor West. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. Speaker, last week the Daily Bread Food Bank released their annual Who's Hungry report, and Toronto families were shocked by how dire the situation has become. Food bank visits in Toronto are at the highest levels since the 2008 recession, with seniors listed as the fastest growing group of food bank users, up 27 per cent from last year. The average length of dependence on food banks has gone from 12 to 24 months, with Scarborough families seeing a 30 per cent increase in food bank visits. Wow. Mr. Speaker, these figures are heartbreaking. People are skipping meals so they can pay the bills and keep a roof over their heads. When will this Premier take off her blinders and see that this province is in crisis? Thank you, Deputy Premier. Uh, the Minister Responsible for Poverty Reduction. Minister Responsible for Poverty Reduction. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member from Windsor West for the question. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, all Ontarians believe that no one should have to make the choice in this province between feeding themselves or their child or paying some other bill. We have a moral responsibility to ensure that all Ontarians have access to safe and good food. Mr. Speaker, uh, we know uh, through the research that we've done that there's a number of initiatives that need to be done. We've uh, worked on improving uh, income support programs. If uh, approved, the increase in the minimum wage is going to provide uh, Ontarians a better living wage so they can pay for those uh, needs that they need to. We're working on uh, preventing homelessness in this province to ensure people Answer. have a safe place to, to stay, which includes supports that assist them with all their other daily needs, Mr. Speaker. And I'm happy to answer more in the supplementary. supplementary. Again to the Acting Premier. Mr. Speaker, this government can say that they are taking steps to address inequality with $15 an hour minimum wage and basic income, but the Liberals have had 14 years to make life better in Ontario, and they have failed. In fact, Daily Bread Food Bank explicitly states, well, on paper, the economy may be doing well, but in the real world, many people are not. We know what the Conservatives have said when times get tough. The last Conservative government told low-income families that they could just buy dented cans and eat bologna sandwiches to save money. And in eight years, they never once raised the minimum wage from $6.85. New Democrats will not stop fighting to raise families up, even though this Liberal government keeps pushing them down. When will the Question. Premier get her priorities in order and actually start fighting for Ontarians? Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member from Windsor West for reminding the House about the damage the Conservatives did during their time. Uh, Mr. Mr. Speaker, uh, I'm working in my ministry uh, on the food security uh, strategy, which we'll be consulting on later this fall. Last week, I met with the director of the Daily Fr uh, Bread Food Bank, which is actually in my riding, and she said her number one ask on food security is affordable housing, Mr. Speaker. Oh, and Mr. Speaker, we've extended rent control to all Ontario tenants to make sure all Ontario tenants are treated fairly. We're investing in the homelessness prevention uh, initiatives across the province, Mr. Speaker, to make sure people have a place to stay and the other supports, including good access to food, uh, to have a dignified life. Mr. Speaker, we've been taking action for 14 years, and we will continue to deliver for, on fairness Thank for you. all Ontarians. Start the clock.
The question, the member from Ottawa, Vanier. Merci, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister responsible of children and daycare. Our government has been a real champion of childcare, taking action to make sure that we all have access to quality and affordable childcare. And we know that there was a lot of work to do because this file was not a priority when the party opposite was in power. And I know as a working parent how important it is to have good childcare options. And I think I want to know exactly how much these investments have contributed to the life of families in Ontario. Can the minister tell us what are the plans and what the government has been doing to meet the needs of families in this province? Thank you, Minister Responsible for Early Years and Child Care. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the hardworking member from Ottawa Vanier for this very important question. Speaker, when we came into office, the party opposite had no real plan for childcare, had made no real investments, and had made no real commitments to improve childcare for Ontario families. Speaker, we have been making childcare our top priority for 14 years. For 14 years, we have been investing in early years and childcare. In fact, Speaker, when we came into power, less than 10 per cent of the children in Ontario had access to childcare spaces. Speaker, we have doubled, doubled the number of licensed childcare spaces in Ontario since 2003. And in fact, recently, we committed to doubling the number of spaces again. We have also doubled childcare funding in Ontario to close to $1.5 billion yes, a year. Speaker, we're transforming the way we're delivering early years in childcare. Unlike the party opposite, we're working hard to get it right. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. For all her work that she does on this file that is so important for all working parents across Ontario. It's very encouraging, I think, that we are continuing to work so hard on this file to address the needs of all Ontario families. For the last 14 years, I think we've made huge strides in the file of child care. And I know that the Premier, it's an important file for her as well. So I think it's important for all Ontarians to know that the party opposite does not really have a plan on child care. And I think it's very important that we all know that. So I'm proud to be a member of a caucus that believes in child care and that believes that working parents have a right to have child care options for them. And my constituents, I know, in uh, Ottawa Vanier believe that as well. Many of them are young parents and continue to want to have child care options. Ms. Mr. Speaker, can the minister tell the House about this government's plans for the next few years? Thank you. Mr. Speaker, I am pleased to answer the member's question. Speaker, when the party opposite was in power, there were no ministries dedicated to child care. When the party opposite was in power, there was scarce funding for child care. And when the party opposite was in power, there were no commitments or investments made to improve child care. Speaker, that says volumes about the party opposite. They criticize and attack our hard work. But the I said it once, I'll say it again. Policy, please. No plan or track record, but for us, the commitment to our children will never stop. The Premier made a historic commitment to ensure that 100,000 more children have access to licensed childcare over the next five years. The party opposite are the last people we take advice from. They've consistently voted. Sit down. That's disappointing. New question. The member from Nepean Carlton. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Health. Uh, yesterday, the government announced an opioid emergency task force to deal with the growing crisis around opioid abuse and overdoses. In addition, the government announced $220 million to fight the opioid crisis. Uh, given I've been calling for a task force since last February, I've openly supported these announcements and thank the minister personally. Today, the Assembly will debate Nick's law, which would dedicate a portion of Ontario's advertising budget to opioid awareness and education. And In just 36 hours, we have had over 24 signatures on a petition calling for this law to pass. Uh, as a show of good faith, I'm hoping that the minister will support this. Can he speak to it? Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, I appreciate the member opposite's advocacy on uh, this uh, critically important subject, uh, and uh, it is true. She, uh, we have had uh, quite a number of conversations, and she has been a powerful, appropriate, and tremendous advocate uh, with regards to Ontario facing a public health emergency with regards to opioids. And, um, 
And Mr. And Mr. Speaker, and I, and I know that she's doing it from the right place and in, in, in the spirit of, uh, of wanting to make a difference and contribute to uh, all our efforts to uh, diminish and eventually end this crisis. I look forward to the debate this afternoon on her bill. Uh, I uh, applaud her from, for, for also focusing on the reality that we, among the many touch points we have to impact this, public awareness and education Answer. is a critically important aspect of that. So thank you for the question. I look forward to talking more in the supplementary in detail. Thank you, supplementary. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. I, I think I misspoke. It was 2,400 signatures that we got in 36 hours. Uh, Nick's law is named for Nick Cody, who was a teenager when he died by overdose from what his dad said was just one bad pill. The stories I hear every day would sink your heart. Kids as early as 10 years old are taking pills that could c contain a deadly dose of fentanyl. Yesterday, I was shocked that car fentanyl has appeared on the streets of the city of Ottawa. Just to put this into perspective, it is 10,000 times more powerful than morphine and even stronger than fentanyl, and it's being found on the streets in our city, so we have to be much more vigilant. Um, will the minister commit to an immediate public health advertising campaign to warn Ontarians against this deadly and potent drug that is now making the rounds in Ottawa? Thank you. Thank, well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, we have committed to uh, such a public health awareness and education campaign, and in fact, we are implementing it, Mr. Speaker. So we're already working with our public health units, providing them with the updated and necessary materials, so that through their ability, uh, including with their partners across uh, Ontario, can provide that critically important information. We're working with the Ministry of Education, Mr. Speaker, and other ministries to ensure, in the correct way, in, in impactful way. Way we are able to reach high school students, those in colleges and universities. We're working with the Minister of uh, Higher Education, Advanced Education, Advanced Education Mr. Yeah. Speaker, and we're also working with our pharmacists to ensure that at the point of contact, when a, an opioid prescription is either provided for the first time or renewed, that that individual also have the requisite information. And we're working Answer. with our bar owners and our nightclubs so that at that point, where we're able to reach those individuals appropriately with the right information and most importantly, with our harm reduction workers Thank you. for that same purpose. Minister of Transportation, our point of work. Speaker, I didn't have the chance earlier today to uh, welcome two guests, Kathy and Peter Kitely, who are here in the gallery. I believe they are the parents of my legislative assistant and issues manager, Alana. Welcome to Queen's Park. Thank you. I, uh, I have a point of order from the member of Haldeman Norfolk that we would want to hear. I uh, wish to inform this House with uh, sadness the passing of my uh, predecessor, former MPP Norm Jameson. NDP member for Norfolk from uh, 1990 to 1995, and uh, to those of us uh, who knew Norm, uh, a true gentleman. Friday, October 6th is Norm's funeral, and the flag here at uh, Queen's Park will be at half staff. I'd rest his soul. I have another sad announcement. No. No. A heavy heart. This is the last day for our pages. I would, uh, I would beg that we offer our thank you for the work that they've done in our church. We saved the jocularity for another time, so we will. Uh, there are no deferred votes, so therefore we will recess until uh, 1 p.m. this afternoon.